started. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you to Dr. Osterholm for doing this. Uh, he's a very busy guy right now, as you can imagine. Uh, we hosted him uh, in 2017 for this amazing book, Deadliest Enemy, which I reread last night. And basically, it predicts pretty much everything that just uh, has un as it's unfolded right now. Uh, Dr. Osterholm is uh, one of the world's leading uh, experts on infectious diseases. Uh, he's at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and so I was, we're going to, I'm going to have a, ask him some questions that I'm going to open up to you. And uh, because we have limited time, let's just dive straight in. Uh, so Dr. Osterholm, um, the head of the World Health Organization last night said we're in uncharted territory. Is that a reasonable question or way of framing this? Uh, it is relative to the conditions that we see in the world right now, meaning not just the cases of uh, COVID-19 infection, but also in terms of just this uh, global uh, relationship we have with uh, manufacturing, with supply chains, with transportation. And so uh, even the 1918 pandemic didn't present those challenges that we see today uh, with the combination of disease and, and economic, social, and political conditions in the world. We've had other coronaviruses which you worked on extensively, like SARS and MERS. I mean, what, what's the difference between this uh, coronavirus and those coronaviruses, which, although they were highly problematic, didn't really kill very many people, relatively speaking. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Gunvir. And, and uh, let me just take a step back. I think this might help set the table for this discussion. Um, we have quite convincing evidence right now that this virus emerged in the Wuhan area in about the third week of November. And we can actually tell from the genetics of the virus that that, in fact, is the case because we can predict the kinds of changes that occur over time. And I'll come back to that later. Why that's important is because it sets up our understanding of where we're at right now. Note that the uh, epidemic wasn't even really identified in Wuhan until towards the end of December, even though, as I mentioned, it had likely jumped and almost like potentially a lightning strike kind of jump from an animal to a human. And I do believe that's the case. I don't believe that there has been man-made interference, whether unintentional or intentional, in terms of the release of this organism. Um, and the reason it took almost five to six weeks is because when we even think about infectious disease transmission, we often come back to that concept of R naught or how many people on average does someone transmit the virus to. And uh, what we see with this one is it's a, probably about an R naught of 2 to 2.5. It's surely dynamic. If you think of regular influenza, it's about 1.4. If you think about pandemic influenza, it tends to be about 1.8 people. So this is quite different. Um, it took yet be that number of weeks before it was detected because you go from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32. And when you think about, uh, we now know that probably about 80% of the infections are very mild, uh, if not asymptomatic. And so before you could get that, you might say, tip of the iceberg to emerge, uh, you had to actually build case numbers up during that time period. And then when by the time it got uh, detected in Wuhan in the end of December, we were now talking about big numbers going from 5, you know, 100 to 1,000 to 2,000 to, to um, 4,000. And these were occurring about every six to seven days. Um, so today what we have happening right now is that we are seeing this kind of transmission around the world that is occurring much like Wuhan did early on. The Chinese have clearly suppressed this uh, activity there with uh, clear, the most, uh, I would have to say, aggressive, if not, uh, you might say, authoritarian efforts in terms of population movement, quarantine, and so forth. And yet we still see uh, uh, today the numbers are down slightly, but we've been averaging about four to 500 cases a day in China for the last 10 days. So it's still activity there. And I want to emphasize that I'm convinced that that activity is going to, in a sense, have a, a major resurgence once China releases some of these population control measures to get the economy back working. And so that from that standpoint, uh, we really do have a challenge in terms of, of even there expecting to see this resurgence. The rest of the world got seeded after Wuhan. And so we had actually here at our center had put out a document that actually said the last week of January in that time, that it would be about one month and the rest of the world would pop. 
And the reason we mean that was is it would take that much time before case numbers would build up in other areas around the world, and that much of what we were doing to try to stop transmission from China was pretty much useless because, in fact, this is influenza virus-like transmission. It's not MERS or SARS, which gets me back to MERS and SARS. What's different here is the fact that SARS and MERS both, and I was very involved with both uh, outbreak investigations. I've actually, um, again, was at, it, spending part of my time at the U.S. government at HHS during the SARS outbreak. Uh, with MERS, I've investigated outbreaks in the Arabian Peninsula, as well as having been at Samsung Medical Center in Seoul, Korea, when that outbreak happened in 2015. Their patients are most infectious day five or later. And it allowed us the opportunity to identify these patients early, get them into protective isolation, make sure that they're on not, even though they're blowing virus out, is zero, meaning that you don't have transmission. And when we didn't do that, we had hospital outbreaks, and we quickly realized that that was going to be an important thing to stop. And then we could get a hold of the contacts and actually follow up with them. And if they started to develop symptoms, we had time to get them into protective isolation and make sure that they didn't get infected. So this is so different than MERS and SARS. Here, virus transmission is occurring early in illness, likely even before symptoms show up, similar to influenza. Uh, the other two coronaviruses, MERS and SARS, were ones we could stop. SARS obviously was stopped because we both got rid of the animal reservoir in the markets of the Guangdong province, primarily palm civets. We can't get rid of the animal reservoir in the Arabian Peninsula. Nobody's going to, you know, basically put down a million point five camels. And so there we're constantly dealing with once a human gets infected, making sure that they don't transmit to others. So, but this was a very, very different coronavirus. Think of this as an influenza pandemic caused by a coronavirus, and you're thinking about this in the right way. What do you think the lethality rate is? If, uh, <clears throat> or do we, I mean, is there a, a kind of approximation? You know, first of all, um, it is variable uh, from the standpoint of uh, who, the, who is actually getting infected. Clearly, we know in China that being older and having underlying health care uh, challenges, as well as being a male, actually were risk factors where up to 14 to 18 percent of that group were uh, uh, not uh, that we're dying from this infection. Um, one of the challenges we have today is understanding that, well, with men in China, smoking is still a very, very common um, uh, habit. And so from that perspective, we think smoking played a big role in, in the increased risk, which we see with even influenza in, in our own country. Um, one of the challenges we have today is that when that moves into a new population, uh, what is going to happen? Um, you know, we saw in total uh, about 2% of the cases of all of, all of the uh, COVID-19 illness is in kids or up to teenagers up to 19 years of age. So it's very rare there, and it just grows up, goes up as you get older. One of the things we're concerned about as this moves out into other parts of the world is one of the other risk factors we know for having this kind of response to this type of pneumonia, which we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, is that also obesity plays a very key role in that. And so now that we're laying this out into parts of the world where obesity in itself is an epidemic problem, um, we think we could see a very different kind of case fatality rate than we're seeing in China that is less gender specific um, and could be something of, of real significance. So we don't know at this point. Um, the number of 2 to 2.5 percent has been used. Um, we've seen it as low as 0.7. The, the uh, WHO report put it between 2 to 4 percent in the Wuhan area and 0.7 percent in the rest of China. I think these numbers are still very suspect. We just, for example, had an outbreak that occurred uh, in a facility, um, a hospital in Korea, where seven of 101 patients in one psychiatric ward who were infected died. Now, there was an, obviously a much higher number there. And so I think it's, at this point, it's, it's not nearly like SARS, which is close to 10%. It's not nearly like MERS, which is 25 to 35%. But it is somewhere between seasonal flu and a bad year, which is 0.1%. In the 1918 pandemic, which of course preferentially it took out uh, young adults of, of 2.5 to 3 percent. So this is this is clearly in that range of what would be considered a severe influenza pandemic if this were the influenza virus. So if a, in a regular year in the United States the lethality rate of flu is 0.1 percent, you're saying that this is what? 
20 to 30 times higher, easily could be. Okay, and, if, and so if 0.1% kills uh, between 30 and 60,000 in any given year in the United States, what are the implications uh, for, in this case? Well, as you are so good at asking questions, Peter, you, you, you ask and answer in such a great way. Uh, I mean, it's obvious that this is a, a very serious challenge. And I think that, you know, it was unfortunate that we had a number of public health people who early on when this happened kept trying to compare it to influenza in a way of saying, well, look, at flu kills many more people in this country. This is a much bigger problem. What they hadn't understood was that they were just watching the opening scene of this particular corona winter, as I call it. And I think that in this regard, we can expect to see a large number of, of deaths moving forward, uh, and we're going to see a lot of uh, morbidity. One of the challenges we have with this illness is that when you do get sick, and, and the Chinese data, which again is the best we have, suggests that anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of people will get severe illness. Uh, of those 5 to 10, this is where we come up with the 2.5% that die. But what's been challenging is these patients need intensive care medicine, and many of them don't die for two to three weeks after they've been hospitalized, after they're consuming health care. Um, and, in fact, the, the hallmark case that so many of us painfully remember was the young 34-year-old physician in China who really brought this to the public's awareness by having um, the – the um, uh, his email or his uh, uh, internet uh, website basically taken down by the Chinese government when he posted on it that these cases were occurring, and you know, he died three weeks into his illness, um, and he actually took a selfie of himself the last week before he died, and then continued to go downhill and eventually died. So one of the challenges we have here is these people do use a lot of health care. And uh, that makes it even more con uh, of a problem relative to influenza in terms of how are we going to respond. Well, that raises a question of, so uh, there are obviously going to be a lot of people with pneumonia who, who don't die, but they're going to be coming into the hospitals. Are we equipped with the ICUs and the ventilators that, to kind of deal with a large scale group of people coming in with these kinds of symptoms? Absolutely not. And that's what we've been talking about. And actually, when I did the, the briefing that you very kindly noted at the beginning of this uh, session in your uh, facility there uh, addressing the book that I wrote, nothing's changed since I wrote that book in terms of better preparedness. We're not. Uh, right now, today, in Minneapolis-St. Paul, every one of the beds that we use for ECMO, this very high-level uh, heart-lung type machine that is very helpful in terms of, of keeping people alive who have this illness are filled. They're all filled. Um, we have really no open beds as such, given that uh, we are just coming off a real or moderate to severe flu season, and that has stretched things. On top of that, we have a number of hospitals right here in the state of Minnesota, as is nas nationwide, that right now have five to ten days of uh, personal protective equipment available for healthcare workers, and that's it. And they've been ordered and ordered and ordered, and it's all in back order because everybody wanted it all at once. And so we're, I very think, I think very likely facing a crisis in terms of protecting our healthcare workers in the next several weeks in many parts of this country. What can be done? Well, I think first of all we have to utilize uh, the. Um, health services we have in different ways, meaning we need to stop elective surgeries. Anybody who's not severely ill with something else clearly needs not to be hospitalized. We need to be preparing our pandemic plan uh, to the point of now thinking through what would we do if we had a 20 to 30 percent jump in the number of hospitalizations we needed. Remember in Wuhan, um, we had a number of people there who were desperately ill, who needed hospital care, who couldn't get into a hospital. And although the numbers varied, uh, there was, it was clear and compelling that many people were dying at home, not in hospital, not because they didn't want to be there, they couldn't get in. We also have not yet fully understood the impact that this had on people who had heart attacks, people who had acute asthma attacks, uh, things where they really had medical crises and couldn't get health care in China because the hospitals were overwhelmed with, uh, with these cases. So I think we're going to run into the same situation here, and our job is going to be triaging uh, this in a way that, that allows us to make sure that we do take care of the sickest patients. Um, the next thing I think we're going to have to do is, of course, think about how we're going to protect our healthcare workers. We need solutions that 
are, are not ideal, but uh, that may work. For example, rather than having one patient in one room, where if you come in and out, you have to doff and don or take on or off the protective equipment. And we know that, for example, in many institutions, that'll average 20 to 25 times a day a healthcare worker will get out of a room. Well, what we may need to do is with the right uh, engineering, so we're making sure that from an airflow standpoint, we're not sending air to other parts of the hospital, but open up wards where everyone in the ward is infected, and therefore what you do is you don't go in and out of rooms and doff and don your equipment. You use it constantly for potentially you know, much of a shift. And so there are things we can do that way, but we still have uh, a great likelihood that we're going to face shortages, and we don't have good answers for that right now. What do we do? And we'll be reverting back to surgical masks as opposed to N95 respirators. Surgical masks we know are ineffective. Um, there's well now an estimated 4,500 healthcare workers in China who have become infected providing care. Many of those were early in the outbreak when it wasn't completely understood just how infectious this virus is, but there have been a number since that time, and a large part of it's been tied to the absence of, of adequate respiratory protection. Are you saying that uh, the N95 respirator is not available in any meaningful quantity? It's not, and part of the problem is, is this is, when you asked me early on why, you know, is this different, you know, uh, in the quote-unquote olden days, just a decade or two ago, when you were looking at storing or stockpiling uh, equipment that you needed for your institution, you counted on it taking some time to arrive even after you ordered it. It may have been an order via, uh, an e uh, by mail or a telephone call. Uh, today, we just assume that when we go on our computers and we get onto a site and we put in an order for X uh, something, that it will arrive the next day by FedEx. And unfortunately, far too much planning has been done making the assumption supply chains would be stable, that they could handle surge capacity or need, and they can't. And so manufacturers right now uh, in North America are manufacturing as quickly as they can uh, this equipment, but basically... Healthcare has been uh, so uh, uh, financially in rough shape here in this country. No healthcare organization has gone out and stockpiled lots and lots of protective equipment. They have always bought it on a just in time basis. And so now we're paying the price for that. Some have said, well, this is in part because uh, it's all made in China. And there are many things which, for which we are heavily dependent on China, including our critical drugs we use in this country. But uh, believe it or not, actually a fair amount of uh, personal protective equipment actually is made right here in North America. But no matter, uh, we can't catch up. And so, uh, you know, if we had six to 12 months to get ready uh, and people understood the severity of what we were facing, then we might have had enough on hand. But, um, you know, the estimates are right now that we are many, many fold below what we would need to reasonably get through this situation as uh, we expect it might unfold. In terms of the respir respirators? In terms, in terms of respirators and potentially some of the other protective equipment, goggles and so forth. But, uh, but so this is going to be a challenge. And I think that I wrote a piece in uh, the Washington Post uh, several weeks ago about protecting healthcare workers as our frontline activity uh, because I believe, as goes our healthcare facilities, our hospitals, our long term care facilities, goes the sense of uh, how much the uh, country believes that we are actually handling the situation. And when healthcare workers start dying and they, or they get severely ill and they go from being care providers to someone needing care, um, and hospitals are not able to handle patients because of a reduced number of healthcare workers, uh, I think that's when you run the risk of people losing complete confidence in what's happening. Um, you know, uh, and, and one area I worry desperately about is kind of a perfect storm, is we know today long-term care, which we have major uh, needs here in this country for that, uh, that there's been a challenge finding workers to work in long-term care, and uh, if we overlap this virus with workers and the outbreak in Kirkland, Washington right now in the long-term care facility there is a classic example. If you take out most of the workers uh, and you have sick patients, who takes care of them? And so I think this is going to be a huge challenge. What a, did you, you saw the news about the million tests by the end of the week. What do you make of that? I think that's true. I think we will have that many tests available. Um, and um, uh, when I say available by the end of the week, we'll be gearing up to that. We expect this week itself to have about 75,000 tests available. But by the end of the week, with all the new 
um, sources of testing, we're going to get geared up for that. Um, and, where, and, those, where will those tests happen? Where will those tests happen? I mean, what's the kind of test for the tests, as it were? I mean, is it going to be geographically centered on where these outbreaks are, or randomly? We're going to see most, I think, uh, state health departments clearly having the capacity to test in all 50 state health departments and at least 12 or 15 large city health departments. In addition, other uh, medical centers are bringing on their own tests that they are very used to doing with PCR. These are the ones that will be applying for the additional emergency authorization to do that. Um, so I think you're going to see a variety of different places. One of the challenges we had with the CDC problems with this test is when they first applied for emergency authorization use by the FDA requirements, that gave that test the only access uh, for people to use a test to that particular CDC test. And the FDA has had to respond to that and basically relax that requirement and uh, allow others to also apply for emergency authorization use. And so I think it's a combination of factors. We'll see much more in the way of public health laboratories. Uh, we will see much more in the private sector uh, coming forward. And again, you know, it's, it was a, a, a really very unfortunate situation. We didn't have the kind of testing here in this country that much of the rest of the world has enjoyed for at least four to five weeks. Why was that? Uh, you know, they uh, had a problem with Plan A, and nobody had a Plan B, C, or D. And uh, this was really a, a, a terrible situation. And How do you grade uh, the Trump administration on this? Well, you know, I, I, I think it was, I'll, I'll say right now, a CDC. How, however, you know, it could have happened under anybody's administration, but there should have been a plan to deal with it when it happened. And there wasn't. And that's what I think frustrated the people out here in the field, is that we knew we had transmission ongoing and that we unfortunately were in a sense reinforcing this uh, f almost I call it uh, fantasy that we somehow had stopped transmission coming into this country. And what I have said multiple times over the past six weeks is all we did was fix three of the five screen doors in our submarine. And that in fact, we knew that we had cases coming in border control as was set up, may have slowed down new cases coming into this country uh, to some degree, but surely was far from stopping it. Look at the situation in Seattle. There was a case that was detected in January. Uh, the individual was put in isolation, but not before he had been in the community. And in fact, this was written up like this was a great success uh, in terms of stopping ongoing transmission. Well, as you know, at least one of the patients who was tested in Seattle, uh, a 19-year-old individual, some six weeks later has virtually the same strain, which by all scientific uh, agreement is in fact a progeny of that original strain, meaning that's likely where it came from, meaning that there had to be at least six or seven generations of transmission between the time that the individual first arrived in the United States from China back in January, and this case now who, who was ill this past week. So we've had ongoing transmission in this country. We should have had testing that could have picked it up. Um, and uh, while any organization can have a problem with a test like this, uh, the fact that there was no plan B, C, or D is really unfortunate. How does this unfold, and what's the kind of timeline here? Well, you know, um, this outbreak, from our perspective, has really unfolded on time. And what I mean by that is back in um, even, even the second week of January, it was very clear that this was no longer going to be a MERS or SARS-like situation with transmission. It was much more dynamic. Clearly, it was acting very much like a flu virus. And so we have a group here at the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy called the SIDRAP Leadership Forum, which involves a number of organizations and companies that we advise on a routine basis. And we've, we've actually been having daily update phone calls on what was going on dating back to the second week of January. And at that time, we said, all bets are off. This is no longer a MERS or SARS-like situation. We're not going to control it. This is influenza, and it's going like transmission, and it's going to continue. Um, by the end of January, uh, we actually put out to this group that it was just a matter of about probably four to six weeks, and we're going to see this pop internationally. And it was going to happen in a big way as we went through the same kind of phenomena that we saw in Wuhan, where it took five to six weeks before it really in fact, took hold. 
Well, you know, um, I said the earliest we're probably going to see this will be early, you know, the last week of February, but then don't be surprised if you see many countries in, uh, where you have transmission. It will be widespread, and it will appear like it's brand new when, in fact, it's been going on for generations, meaning of, of the virus transmission. So Iran, Italy, Korea, none of these surprised us. Um, they, they were what you would predict. So when we go from 26 countries uh, 15 or 14 days ago, and we're now up into the 70s, you know, this shouldn't have been a surprise. Much of it was more of a detection issue than it was even brand new transmission. So for our country, we've been saying for some time, there is widespread transmission going on in this country right now. It's just being missed. And as soon as we have uh, testing, we're going to see it. I was on a, a public television show last Friday night, knowing that uh, certain states had received their test kits. They were going to begin testing, and I actually said on Friday night, you know, within the next 72 hours, I think you're going to see this thing pop in the United States, and we're going to see it in multiple locations. And in some locations, we're probably going to docu document extensive transmission without any knowledge of what had happened in Seattle. Um, so I think that this is really playing out on time. So now where do we go from here? I think a couple things. This is a challenge in terms of where does it go by time. Let me make one point really clear, which I think has, has not received uh, sufficient discussion. We keep hearing that this is going to die out with the spring warmer weather in the northern hemisphere, somehow as if we're the whole world. And part of that is based on what has happened with the MERS and SARS coronaviruses. And, and uh, SARS in particular, which SARS ended in 2003 in June. But, you know, having been very involved with that outbreak uh, situation, let me just say, you know, we first detected it in the quote-unquote non-Guangdong province area in February of 2003. And it took us some time, meaning at least a month and a half to two months, to really understand the epidemiology of what I described earlier, where transmission was occurring much later in the clinical course and so that we could identify, isolate these people, uh, we could work with their contacts, and also understand what the actual reservoir was in the Guangdong markets so that they could be eliminated, which was largely palm civets, and that really stopped the virus from pinging humans, and we just had to clean it up in the human population, which took until literally June. But it had nothing to do with the seasons at all. I've investigated outbreaks of MERS on the Arabian Peninsula, and I've stood outside of hospitals uh, when it was 110 degrees, and inside was going a, a ravaging outbreak. Um, and uh, I've seen transmission from camels year round. There's nothing in the MERS literature. I, you know, the outbreak in Samsung Medical Center, which was hundreds of cases uh, in a hospital transmission, occurred in May to June of that year. So, so don't think that that means it. But let's just take a look at flu, even if we want to use that as a model, because that's what the other thing people do. They say, well, seasonal flu ends. Remember, yes. Influenza is at its peak in the northern and southern hemispheres during their respective winters, but it circulates year-round in the tropics. We've never understood that. It's always in the tropics. And if you look at the last 10 influenza pandemics that have occurred over the past 250-some years, two started in the winter, three started in the spring, two started in the summer, and three started in the fall. In every case, the second or the big wave was always displaced by about six months. If you look at 2009 with H1N1, we knew that activity started there probably late February, early March. We picked it up in April, early April, and uh, we had that initial peak of cases that occurred in April and May around the world. But the second big peak occurred in, in, this, in North America and in many parts of the world in mid-September to mid-October when it was still very warm, again, displaced by six months. And if you go back and look at all the other pandemics, that'll happen in the same way. So there is no model here that says this is going to go away. Uh, I, you know, if it does, it does. And, you know, it's obviously a new phenomenon for us. But I would say we have to be prepared to see this run a course for at least months yet. Uh, the other thing that we have ahead of us, which is a challenge, is that with influenza, we know we have some natural protection in the population because of previous infections that were close by. In 2009, uh, we had a relative absence of cases in those who were 65 or years of age and older. Um, and if you look back, these were the same people that would have been younger adults and children 
that we're still on the remnants of the actual 1918 virus that continued to circulate into the 1930s. So, you know, they obviously still had some protection. We have no evidence of any protection with this coronavirus right now uh, in the population. Um, and so that to that extent, you know, we have kind of a virgin territory here in terms of the number of people that might get infected. And so is it going to be like the typical seasonal flu year where 10 to 20 percent of the population gets infected? We don't know. It could be a lot more. That's why even when we talk about case fatality rate, you know, if you have a, a disease that has a very high case fatality rate, but only 100 people get it every year, that's not nearly the same significance as a disease that has a low case fatality rate of 1%, but a billion people get it. And so what we don't understand here is how this virus is going to interact in terms of the number of people infected on top of the case fatality rate. This is surely going to be, everything we have says it's going to be a lot worse than a bad seasonal flu year. How many people died in the 57 flu in the States? Uh, actually, I think it was about 80,000. I don't have the number right in front of me, but, but if you actually look at that, what happened in 57 and 68, well, those were outbreaks uh, in a sense of, of what was seasonal flu, but on kind of a steroid basis, meaning H3 in, H2N2, which caused the 57 outbreak, and H3N2 that caused the 68 outbreak, the pandemics were basically just seasonal flu, but a lot more of it. So, I mean, the average age of deaths was in the 60s. If you actually look at the 1918 outbreak, it was very interesting. The average age of deaths was 29. And, of course, we know in some locations uh, it was as high as 3 to 5% of the young adult population died. But what people don't realize in 2009, even though the overall deaths were less, the average age of deaths was about 39 years. And if you actually adjust in life expectancy, meaning that in 1918 life expectancy was about 48 years, in 2009 it was 74 years, the actual age of deaths was younger in 2009 than it was in 1918. Again, both H1N1 viruses are just fortunately a lot less. This one, we don't know what it's going to do other than it looks like it's kind of seasonal flu on steroids, but as I said, once we get into the obesity issue and we start to see, we could actually see in many of the high-income countries around the world, uh, in particular, a very different picture. Dr. Olson, we have a, quite a number of people in the room and also people on the phone, so if you have a question, can you hit your microphone so it's hands-on and we just Anybody has a question, I'll start with Allison. Um, I'm collecting the, the online questions, so I've got yeah. a few here. Um, and the first two are, are somewhat similar. Um, is closing down schools or businesses for a period of time an effective measure to control the spread of the virus? And if so, what would be the optimal length of time for the operation to be closed? Uh, thank you for that very thoughtful question. <laughs> um, this is where I, I, I probably sound like I'm a bit schizophrenic. And uh, if you talk to my kids, they would definitely tell you that's true. <laughs> but, um, you know, we need to start to normalize our response to this. And what I mean is, is that we, we got to be thoughtful. And we can't we can't just knee jerk. You know, right now we're thinking about this kind of like it is when I play checkers with my 10-year-old grandson. You know, one move down the board, and boy, that's a big deal, okay? We need to play this like a chess master, somebody who's thinking out 20 moves down the chessboard. And, and one of the concerns I have is any action we take, there is a significant reaction. And it all should be about, obviously, reducing morbidity and mortality. But let's take schools, for example. Right now, we've all been struck by the relative absence of cases in kids in China. 2.1% 2, 2 of uh, cases are 19 years of age or younger. Case fatality uh, rate is very, very, very low, very few cases as such. There's only been a couple of examples where people have actually looked at kids who were otherwise largely healthy and looking for virus shedding. And each of those occurred in family settings where other family members were quite ill or died and the kids didn't appear to get sick. And so they actually tested the kids though just to see. And in several instances, they did find kids shedding virus. Well, we've got to really, really understand that because I think there's a case to be made. We don't want to close schools. Uh, that in fact, it won't have the kind of impact with influenza. We want to do that because we have clear and compelling data that kids can serve as a major reservoir for this virus and seed it through communities. And in fact, even with seasonal flu, when we close down schools for the Christmas holiday often, uh, that actually will slow down transmission in communities when you get kids out of schools. So, and here's a case in point where I'm all for closing schools if we show that kids are important disseminators of the virus. 
But if it's only because we are going to do that now when they're not that, but that's what we've always done, then I think we make a mistake because, for example, school closings have tremendous impact on communities, workforce yeah. in particular, and, and, and they disproportionately affect the lower socioeconomic status individuals who don't have alternatives. They've got to stay home with their kids, and then they don't get paid. And so one of the things that we don't want to do is react like that. So that's one thing. For businesses, you know, this is one area where, again, it's a major challenge. You know, we've got to keep the lights on. We've got to keep food coming. And we've got to keep really critical drugs coming. One of the areas that we have been very involved with has been looking at the supply of critical life-saving drugs in the United States, for that matter, around the world. And uh, we've been studying this now for over the past year and a half, and we brought together uh, several groups of medical treatment experts uh, a year, a year and a half ago, and came up with a list of 153 different critical life-saving drugs that people need right now or people die. What's on the crash cart, what's in the emergency room, that kind of thing. And in that list of drugs, we found all of them are generic, most of them made outside the United States, and 63 of the 153 were already on some form of shortage status, meaning that just with routine commerce, they, we didn't have enough. When you trace that back and you look at the supply chains, many of them originate in China. And what isn't made in China is made in India, but in many cases, the uh, API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, will come from China. And so one of the things we're trying to study is that because one of the nightmares I have is that as we start to see the major increase in cases of this coronavirus infection in the United States is also overlaps in kind of a perfect storm way with the, you know, we exhaust the supply chains we do have in place, meaning that there was product in the pipeline before this happened, but it's only two to three months worth, and that even then we're going to start running out of these drugs. And so there we need to keep commerce going. We need to keep uh, this this situation where we can get life-saving drugs and critical medical supplies and things like that and food to people. So we need to balance what we talk about when we say that, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to, you know, uh, basically have people go to work. Let me just give you one last point. Power. Here's an example. We take that for granted all the time. When you're in a low-income country, power is never taken for granted because you never know when you're going to get it. In the United States, we still supply about 30 to 35 percent of our electricity with coal. Much of the coal that comes in, into this uh, system in the North America comes from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming and Montana. It's high BTU, low sulfur coal. It's a kind of coal that you just can't get anywhere else in the United States, and you can't use uh, other coal in these uh, generators. Well, it turns out that the coal that comes out of the Powder River Basin is delivered on coal trains to all parts of the United States. And these coal trains are very unique, 110 car trains made out of aluminum, and the weight is remarkable. And it turns out that these are so specific in terms of the track that they run on that the engineers who actually run these trains go several hundred miles each day, one way, get off, go back home because, I mean, they drive, take a train back to their original location, because if you're not going 28 miles an hour at this point, you won't get over a peak. But if you're going more than 32 miles an hour here, you tip. And so they run these coal trains almost like the old riverboat captains did in the Mississippi and the Ohio River long before we had radar. And today, you know what, if those, if those coal train drivers uh, go down with this, we're in big trouble because you can't put a National Guard replacement on that train and run those trains. I mean, if you're an airplane pilot, you know, if you're an airlines pilot, you can fly into any airport in the world with the book in your hand knowing, you know, what the issues are. You can't do that here. We've had major shortages occur. Plant Shear, which is one of the largest plant, uh, electrical generating plants in the world, is outside of Atlanta. And we've had a number of times when their coal supplies have gotten down to a day or less. So we think about that kind of part of business. We've got to keep those coal train drivers as safe as possible. And how we're going to do that is a real question. And I could go through other examples like this where we just forget about how we depend on that tar part of our world for existence. And if we don't have electricity, we won't be running hospitals because not only do they need electricity, even with their electrical generators, remember the electrical generators come from diesel fuel, which is actually made at refineries that need electricity to make the, to make the diesel fuel. So that's what we just haven't thought through, the consequential, what I call collateral damage issues. Other questions? Uh, thank you. This is really helpful. Um, 
just to to further your point about schools and businesses um, and from a research standpoint how long will it take to know um, whether school-aged children are transmitting it or if they're vectors for this um, and just to know more broadly uh, more about how it's being transmitted to whom and, and et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know when we're going to know. I, uh, we need this research done badly. Uh, it was clearly one of the priorities that came out of the WHO working group meeting uh, about three weeks ago that these are pieces of data. You know, I'm at the point where I think we have to make our best estimates of what might happen in some cases we don't have the data. <clears throat> one of the things I have been advocating for for some time, weeks in this situation, knowing that it was going to get this bad, I think this is probably going to get handled ultimately almost on a state-by-state -state basis where, uh, you know, there's not going to be a federal blanket, do this or do that. They'll say, take it back to your local leaders. And I think every state right now should have a COVID-19 task force that's made up of elected officials, bipartisan, it's made up of public health experts and public health officials, the medical community, uh, certain selected pri uh, private sector people who basically are going to wrestle with the fact, what do we do in our state? And then have everybody do it. The last thing we want to do is, well, this seven school district is going to stay open, these four school districts are not. You know, how are we going to make sure we prioritize that we have food? You know, I, I find this challenging for me because if I hear it one more time from a media person, I'll probably scream. But, oh, my God, we can't tell them this or they'll panic. What is panic? You know, I've, I've not seen anybody panic yet. You know, the closest I've seen is, you know, people going out and exhausting the toilet paper supply at Costco, okay, which you know, <laughs> makes about as, as much sense as the gas lines we had the night of 9-11, as you recall. We had gas, you know, cars lined up for two miles to get gas because somebody started doing it, everybody did it. But we don't see the kind of behavior that's riding in the streets, you know, uh, setting cars on fire, injuring people, uh, you know, people, ta you know, doing harmful things to themselves or family members because of this. And, and the way we even minimize that is to just tell people what we know and don't know, straight talk, and then get consensus. So how are we going to handle this here? And make it a, a nonpartisan science and policy group. And I think that's where we're going to ultimately have uh, our best chance. Now, somebody who's on a, a national, in a national company or international company says, I don't want 50 states telling me what to do. But I think what you're going to find is, is that for them, how they handle workers, how they – for example, I'm, I'm, I'm right now uh, probably not on, in the majority voice and surely not popular, but I think quarantining people coming back from high-risk countries today is, is a misnomer and totally unproductive. Meaning that right now, I, I think you could just as easily make the case we should be basically quarantining slash a travel alert to King County and Sonoma's counties in, in the northwestern part of the United States as we do Italy. And yet look what we've done to Italy and in Iran and Korea. We've got as much transmission around the world right now in many places, and it's going to happen everywhere. And how many places can you finally cordon off before you say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're all walled off here in the United States, and we're just as bad. I was asked this, in fact, in a, in a radio show a week ago, and, and I meant it kind of tongue-in-cheek, but um, somebody said, asked the question, well, when will we know the United States is really in a big hurt, big problem with that? And I said, it's when Air China refuses to fly here because it's too risky. You know, and I think that, that in a sense, that's what we need to do. So I would actually say, now we need to start normalizing. Don't do these quarantines because there's just as many people likely in this country who are going to pose a risk as people coming back from countries with disease problems. That's the kind of thinking we need to start having now. How are we going to get through this? Um, you know, public health has got to stop doing contact tracing. You know, it, it, it works when it's a few cases, but I'm telling you right now, you could have all the public health workers in the world working on this thing and we wouldn't have nearly enough and what we do is not do public health just just take a step back and think about this well it's not a perfect correlation you know we've had almost what 2600 people die from ebola in the drc area uh in terms of of our outbreak we've had the last several years and every resource has been so uh targeted from that local area <clears throat> and during the same time period over 7,000 kids have died from measles in that area because we don't have the measles vaccine campaigns going on like we once did. 
And so we have to start thinking about, yes, we want to deal with the problem at hand, but we also have to start dealing with the collateral damage. And in some cases, the collateral damage may actually be worse than the actual disease outbreak. So businesses, I hope we can keep them running as much as possible. Um, you know, whether you're at work or you're at home, the person who does remote work uh, with a, their business, that's great. But then when they go out that night to the grocery store or the shopping center, you know, what have they just done? I mean, it, it's not going to be any different. So I think this is part of what I, I think about when we talk about seasonal flu. When's the last time somebody basically greatly altered their work setting the business operations based on flu. This is worse. I don't disagree, but somehow we've got to take lessons from that and move into normalizing our response to this. Or we will, we will, you know, all, you know, shut up in our homes and, uh, and I'm not sure what that accomplishes. Hi, um, tying right into that, I actually have travel planned to Indonesia and uh, the Philippines in a few weeks. And so I've been closely monitoring this. Um, and I wasn't too concerned until yesterday, a Time article came out that said it's like statistically implausible or almost impossible that countries like Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia don't have cases. Um, but so far they are reporting zero. Um, so is it a case of like uh, not doing their due diligence of making tests? Um, or they're covering up and so I'm kind of curious if there is a way to um, I don't know like not hold accountable but like how do we combat like governments maybe not being uh, transparent around what's going on in their country well you know I I, uh, I thank you uh, again uh, another very thoughtful question I, I don't really worry about governments being transparent I, I'm assuming that number one because it doesn't matter assume it's everywhere this is a global influenza pandemic caused by a coronavirus happening. And even if governments were completely truthful uh, in all regards, uh, I'm not sure because, I mean, we, w we were not lying in the United States a week ago when the president got up in front of the country and laid out the number of cases we had confirmed. That was true. But did it reflect the reality of what was happening? Absolutely not. Um, and so I think that many countries around the world may have some of the same problems of testing and what they know. So I just assume it's everywhere. Now, given that, the, the question becomes, do you still want to do international travel? Well, I think there are two things to consider there. One is surely being in, in large numbers of people. Anybody who's ever been to Indonesia, Jakarta, et cetera, you know there's a lot of people. You're going to likely increase the chances of being exposed and getting infected. Now, depending how long you're there, and your age, your underlying health status, et cetera, if you need hospitalization, do you want to be hospitalized in Indonesia? And then the final piece is, is that you have to ask yourself, you know, what's my government going to do tomorrow? You know, I actually raised this issue the, the uh, second day that the Italy cases started to emerge and I, with our CIDRAP leadership group, and I actually said, um, you know, I wonder, it'll be interesting if a week from now we put a travel alert on there and, on Italy. We did. And so there's no rhyme or reason today necessarily when countries will have travel alerts or quarantine issues uh, because many of these are being made politically, not based on, on what I call the best science. I mean, we're still seeing the administration taking credit for having, quote, unquote, limited transmission in the United States with the work that was done, you know, with the travel issues with China, with the airport screening, which – the last number I had, it was well over 600,000 people had been screened and not one case had been detected. Um, and so I think, but that made people feel good. We were doing something. And what I'm concerned about is being on international travel status, we don't know what that's going to mean. Now, I would tell you, if you have a chance to go on a cruise ship right now, I'd bypass that one. Cruise ships have been notoriously a problem with respiratory transmitted agents because we know all the recirculated air that occurs in the inside cabins. And uh, I would have told you that a long time before the, the uh, Diamond Princess happened. So I'd say definitely stay away from that. But if you do international travel, I don't think that it's putting you that much higher risk other than large crowds to getting infected. But I think the idea of do I want to get hospitalized in country X and do I know that I can get back into the United States – uh, without a 14-day quarantine, I think are questions that make me want not to do international travel right now. This is all really interesting, slightly terrifying, but um, thank you for taking the time. <laughs> sure. um, my question is, there, there's a whole lot of people in this country who don't have paid sick time. And I'm wondering, um, 
what there is that we can do in the short term to encourage those people to actually not come to work or is there anything we can do? I don't know if there is really anything we can do. I think that again, it's uh, people's comfort level. You know, one of the things I talked about in my book was, you know, that which kills us, that which hurts us, that which concerns us and that which scares us sometimes are all very different. And, you know, people are reacting to this differently relative to what has happened with seasonal flu. And there may be some good reason for that relative to the increased number of deaths. But again, knowing that those to date at least have been largely older populations and people with underlying health conditions. So, again, how do you keep people coming to work? You know, it, we've had... Uh, uh, situations here in a very limited way, but as more case numbers increase, that'll change where someone finds out a coworker was infected and, you know, there is a real concern at the workplace about what does that mean. And again, I think that this is where preparedness comes in. Every workplace setting today should be discussing this right now with their employees. This is what we know. This is what we're going to do. Um, you know, if they were sitting at a desk uh, that desk is not, you know, a highly radioactive viral, uh, you know, cauldron right now. Uh, you know, at the very least, it can be just wiped down and it's fine. Uh, and that from a respiratory standpoint, you may have been exposed. What you need to do is over the next 14 days, if you develop a respiratory illness, uh, this is what needs to be done. How you, you know, don't go into your doctor's office, call ahead. And I think when you lay out more what will be done, people are more willing to say, okay, well, I, this could happen whether I'm at work, it could happen whether I'm at a PTA meeting, or it could happen if I have to go to the grocery store. Uh, I think the one thing that I do have concern about is that some people are so reliant right now on some kind of face protection and thinking that that's going to help them. Uh, you know, we are urging that all N95s be used by healthcare workers or critical infrastructure workers only not for the general public. We're going to not have enough. And, and again, I've already made the case why we should be protecting our healthcare workers. People may then rely on surgical masks, which will play little to no role in reducing transmission. It can only help for those who are infected. If you put one on when you cough out or you're breathing out, in many cases, the large droplets and to some degree, even the smaller ones will basically stick to the inside of that mask and reduce your transmission load into the environment, but not, not stop it. So I think at this point, uh, to come back to the workplace setting, it's just the more information you can give, you know, people are going to realize they have to move on with their lives. Again, if remote working is possible, do it if they want to do that, but at the same time, then warn them, but at least help them understand. If you do that for, you know, 70% of the day, but then you spend the night out, you know, at a restaurant or whatever, you know, you've kind of more or less, uh, in a sense, minimized all that you did during the day to protect yourself. Hey, go ahead. Hi, I have a quick question about pandemic communication. So I think definitely as compared to SARS in 2003 and even MERS in 2012, our access to information, like a 24-hour news feed on our phone, push notifications, and social media really lets everyone follow the pandemic yeah. as it evolves. Everything that happens is reported. And I'm just wondering if you think that increased access has been a positive thing or how it really affects response to the pandemic. Um, and if after covering so many pandemics, you think there are any best protocols for reporting and science communication? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. That is really a very uh, <laughs> important point. Um, first of all, I fortunately haven't call, really covered that many pandemics. Uh, you know, it's clearly the 2009 H1N1 was a pandemic, a worldwide epidemic of, of a new disease. Um, but uh, I'm clearly in the middle of this one. I think you're right about social media. And also, though, uh, you know, in 2003, we did not rely much at all on China for many supply chains that we do today. So the idea that working together um, uh, with them was very different back then. You know, it, it was a, a different challenge in terms of that. I think today so many people portray themselves as media. Um, whether they're social bloggers, whatever, they're journalists, and, and they're not. And I think that, you know, a journalist is somebody trained 
in the uh, field of communicating, reporting, and how you do that. And I think that that's a very important point. Just as we see with our political systems today, the fractionated populations we have based on this issue. I mean, I have dealt with on multiple occasions over the past couple of weeks, so many conspiracy theory issues about, you know, that China intentionally released this. It was an accidental release. Uh, from the virus center there in Wuhan that, uh, you know, it, it, just any number of different things that are just simply not true. And, you know, I'm not an expert in this area. Peter is actually much more expert than I am. But the idea of the Russian influence uh, on Internet, we have some evidence that they were furthering this whole idea of the fact that this virus was man-made uh, on the Internet. Um, and so I think that that has challenged us. But I think the other part of it is, is that um, – when things get written today, and we see this with vaccines, you know, science literacy in general, people then take it as gospel truth. And if you're following a certain type of messaging, you're looking at certain websites, pretty soon you become convinced this is what's really happening. And so um, we do have challenges today with the media. I have to say it's been somewhat reassuring. Uh, you know, the SIDRAP news team here, which, um, you know, they're a part of SIDRAP, but because I'm in the news, I, there's a very thick editorial wall between myself and them. I read the stories at the same time you do. Um, has had a remarkable increase, and uh, we're now getting millions of readers every month because we're not behind a paywall. Um, you know, the Washington Post, New York Times, uh, you know, Wall Street journalists have done a great job covering this, but they're all behind paywalls. And so for many people, they can't get at it. So there are people are trying to get to legitimate reporting sources. Uh, but nonetheless, your point about what's happening on the Internet is, is continuing. Um, I find the challenges also, though, about the misleading information that then becomes, if it's reported enough times, um, you know, there are some who said that this virus is only transmitted via the hand to the face and so forth, and that's simply not true. We have compelling data on influenza transmission, which this is just like this, in terms of, of ongoing transmission from just breathing and air. And so I think that that's a, that's a, a, a big issue that people don't want to believe that they believe if they just don't, if they wash their hands a lot, they'll be protected. And frankly, hand washing may play some role in this, but not nearly what people think it is. It's all about the air and the air you're breathing. Uh, Dr. Ossam, we know you're super busy, so we really want to oh. thank you very, very much for taking time out of what is an insanely busy time for you to talk to us. And uh, also want to thank the communications team here, Allison, and also Melissa and Joanne for putting this together. So well, and thank you. And Peter, thank you for your leadership and all these topics. Uh, there are many of us out here in the field who count on you for getting us the information about what's really happening in the world. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming.